Oh, hello, everyone. Hi. Try it again. Hello, everyone. Hello. Perfect. As Tim mentioned, I'm, I'm Daryl Harvey. I'm VIU's International Projects Coordinator. Welcome to Global Citizens Week here at VIU. I hope you've been out to many events throughout this week. We're on day five. There's still lots more activities to go, um, including after uh, this very special presentation of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium series, uh, will be a short film called Sadiqa's Garden. So after Marnie's talk, I'd encourage you to, to step out briefly. We have some refreshments, quick snack to keep you going. Um, at 11.45, we'll be starting this, this film, which is just a half hour long, and, uh, and a post-film discussion will be facilitated by some very special guests. Um, so please do stick around for that. Um, it is also my great pleasure to be here today to introduce Dr. Marnie Stanley. Uh, she obviously has lots of fans, uh, and you already know that she is both a well-read scholar uh, and an exemplary professor of studies in women and gender. Marnie studied at the University of Alberta before completing her DPhil at Oxford University. Her areas of study and teaching have included autobiography, sexualities, and popular culture. But Marnie is also an active and engaged global citizen. Marnie has been a great supporter of many social justice initiatives on campus, including in the area of support to refugee students and refugee communities uh, in this region. Back in 2015, uh, Marnie and I worked together very closely with our dean at the time, Dr. Graham Pike, and other engaged members of the VIE community in the development of the Syrian Refugee Response Committee, which at the time led to the sponsorship of uh, a third student refugee pro program student through VIU WUSC. Uh, we had been sponsoring two at the time. It also led to the establishment of the VIU International Refugee Newcomer Award, which since that time has been assisting dozens of refugee newcomers in the community to study at VIU and retrain for new careers. And finally, it also helped facilitate our active participation in Scholars at Risk, which assists uh, academics and scholars who are in places of danger and providing them with an academic opportunity uh, and way out. Marnie has always worked extremely hard to make her classroom, her faculty, and this campus a more inclusive and welcoming space for all students all her and all her colleagues. In this way, she embodies what Global Citizens Week is all about. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marnie Stanley. Thank you so much for coming. I just want to begin by saying that my own family came to Canada as economic migrants on my mother's side seven generations ago from Scotland and Ireland, fleeing famines and enclosures of land and other uh, hardships, settling first in Upper Canada and then making their way to the West Coast, uh, where my mother was um, raised on the shores of uh, Lake Harrison in Rosedale, just outside of Chilliwack. And my father's family, much more recently, economic migrants from England. Uh, his parents immigrated in 1911 from the English villages of Bodicott and King Sutton. Um, Canada was actively recruiting uh, British people at that time. The Victoria, um, school teacher from Victoria, Agnes Deans Cameron, uh, was one of the recruiters at that time. I always like to think maybe she was who talked to them. And they came for a parcel of land in northern Alberta on Treaty 8 territory, land belonging to the Cree people. And when they first immigrated, um, my grandmother stayed in Edmonton and worked as a maid uh, for a lawyer named Rutherford, who would later become the first premier of Alberta after it was um, made into a province, and my grandfather went to the land and built a little log house and cleared uh, and in order for them to get title. So I think one of the things I want to uh, emphasize is the extent to which this is new and not new, the refugee crisis we're in now, um, and there's a lot of history in the issues of, of refugees that we need to keep in mind, including our own stories for those of us who are not indigenous. As I read refugee stories in comics, I see two key strategies emerge. So one strategy focuses on developing sympathy. It focuses on uh, the reader and sympathy and empathy as a reaction 
to what are essentially tales of either rescue or failure to rescue. So sometimes they're tragic, sometimes they're hopeful. But they are works which tend to foreground children or young adults. Um, they focus on the human story of conflict, of endurance, of arrival, and either triumph or the, the sort of idea that triumph is possible. They also tend to evoke gratitude, the expectation of gratitude for the opportunity given by the Global North. And the limitations of this approach are made clear by the team of authors behind refugee imaginaries. And they're using imaginaries in the theoretical sense that that is the sort of symbolic and creative context in which something is discussed, so the, and including uh, social systems like law and so on. So how, when the authors of this wonderful book, which I just got, because it was only published in January, um, they're looking at how uh, refugees are imagined in various media and texts. So how are they imagined in comics? How are they imagined in novels, in film, in, in um, uh, journalism and other forms of media, and in their own stories? So they're looking at that, that social contract piece, that, that creative piece also. So they argue that narrative, quoting here, narrative representation yoked to a humanitarian paradigm concerned with demonstrating the value of the other's humanity obviates other ways of perceiving, such as politically, economically, or ecologically. So they're saying that if we focus just on the human interest part, the, the struggle, the arrival, et cetera, we miss the larger political context, the larger economic context, the larger environmental context. The second strategy that I've observed in this group of comics is to situate the stories within a specific geopolitical and economic context that provides argument for why mass migration is happening, not just that it's happening. So they're really trying to get at the why. So the structure of this presentation is that I begin with the humanitarian ones moving towards so it goes from sort of least political to most political is the arc of this presentation. This strategy um, shows us that there are political reasons, there are economic reasons, there are things happening in the world, including things happening from our portion of the world that are making these things happen elsewhere. And these comics that, that deal more politically offer us ways to analyze how the choices of these, um, these artists and writers help us formulate our own political response, and they direct us towards both understanding and action, as opposed to the, some of the other ones which direct us towards empathy. I want to make clear that I'm not making any legal or moral distinction between the terms refugee, migrant, economic migrant, or asylum seeker. I will note that the phrase asylum seeker seems to be fairly recent and to come up in the late 80s in, under neoliberalism. The idea that if you qualify for asylum under the refugee language of the UN from the 50s and then revised in the 60s, um, why have we attached the word seeker? I think that's a very interesting uh, effect. But I want to note that any discussion of refugees as they are imagined in these works in the comics that we're going to look at is haunted by the terms proliferating on the populist side also. And I mean right-wing populism, not left-wing populism. Words like tide, flood, swarm, sometimes even terrorist. And all of these terms delimit the available representations of the experience, and none of them are neutral. So first up is a comic by uh, Owen Colfer and Andrew Donkin. You may recognize Owen Colfer's name as Artemis Fowl, the writer of Artemis Fowl. Um, and this is their comic, Illegal. And they've created a, a comic for the young adult market. Their hero, Ibo, is a boy of about 12 from Ghana. And he's following his older brother, Kwame, um, when the latter decides to embark. So Kwame is about 16 or 17. He heads for Europe. And when Ibo finds out, he sets off after him. So for the for parts of the book, they're not traveling together. Other parts of the book, they are traveling together. It opens on a boat in the Mediterranean 
as we close in on the two brothers. So it's sort of like a drone shot. We start high up, seeing the map, and then slowly down to a close up. So that's the opening page of the comic, introducing our two characters. And then the backstory of the journey across uh, Northern Africa and across the Sahara is in alternating chapters. So we get a chapter in the boat and what's happening in the boat, and then we get a chapter of the backstory, and so the story progresses through all the frightening phases of the journey and the various challenges these two youth face, including uh, the desert, uh, sleeping in culverts with rats and all kinds of other challenges. The book opens with a quote from Ali Wiesel, part of which is that no human being is illegal. And it concludes with an afterword from the writers and artists, which ends, every person is a human being. The family life of the two boys is represented. So they have a deceased mother. They have an alcoholic and abusive uncle who's allegedly looking after them, but mostly he's making them serve him. And they are living in extreme poverty. But there is no discussion of their nation state, nor of any of the states they pass through, including Libya. What is discussed is the human smugglers and the, the human misery that they're responsible for. The book has beautiful art, and it has a well-told and moving story. Colfer makes sure we know that he lived in Tunisia for a number of years and that has some uh, knowledge of context. And following the afterword, the authors include a short black and white comic called Helen's Story. And we're told that the source of this story is the charity Women for Refugee Women. And they promote three charities at the end of the book, and this, this one is one of them. And the details of Helen's story reveal that it was used as a source for Ebo's story. There's some parts of it that are very uh, part of the, the narrative in the book. And so it functions to authenticate. So we have a real refugee who's pictured in the drawings, um, and, it, and part of her story is used to make his story. So it gives a kind of authentication. And we see in a lot of these comics various devices to make sure that we understand that the comics are truth-telling, right? that they're authenticating the experience that they're talking about. But the overall tone of the book is that this is a crisis that originates far away. And in this particular book, the global north has nothing to do with it. Susan Sontag argues, quote, they show a suffering that is outrageous, unjust, and should be repaired. They confirm this is the sort of thing which happens in that place. They nourish belief in the inevitability of tragedy, in the benighted or backward, that is poor, parts of the world. And this quote comes from Regarding the Pain of Others, which is a long essay by Susan Sontag, a particular favorite work of mine. Reinhard Kleist's um, An Olympic Dream, the story of Samia Yusuf Omar, is biographical. So she's a real person, and it's telling her particular and unique story. He documents his sources, which include her sister and a journalist who knew her. Samia Yusuf Omar represented Somalia in track and field. She was part of their team of two Olympians at the Beijing Olympics. And she drowned in the Mediterranean Sea in April 2012 at the age of 21 while trying to reach Europe. Sorry. Issues of gender figure very large in this particular work as we see uh, in the extent of the representation of the Al-Shahab militants who are constantly harassing her when she tries to run. They know who she is. They recognize her uh, from the fact that she was in the Beijing Olympics. They target her. They threaten her with death. So she really doesn't have any choice but to try to leave. This work is intentionally designed to be suitable for a wide audience. It doesn't show her death, for example, although it, it makes very clear that she's, she has died. Um, and it was originally published in widely circulated publication, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And I just want to talk a little bit about newspapers and comics um, around this, this narrative. Um, and these next three or four slides won't be very good because they're coming from news, newspapers and so they're highly pixelated so they don't translate very well. 
But there's an organization in the UK called Positive Negatives, and they're um, doing a whole series of refugee stories as comics, and they're particular refugees. This one is Caleb's story, and there's an actual photo of Caleb at the end of the comic. And the University of London, um, SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies, is providing curriculum. So this comes from the University of London, and for each story, they provide uh, questions for teachers to use this in the classroom, and they provide uh, contextual materials such as um, news clips from the BBC and things like that. And in the United States, Brown University is doing something similar. They're doing the Choices program, and uh, they're producing comics with refugee stories, again, specific people, specific stories, and again, providing curriculum. We can see that the curriculum does tend to focus on um, the personal. You know, so how are your life experiences different from, from Caleb's, it asks you, um, and how uh, would you talk to him? It does talk about PTSD, so it does acknowledge that uh, the experiences of refugees often lead to trauma because they're so uh, catastrophic. But it doesn't offer much, although if you actually go to some of the news articles and so on that are mentioned in question four, there's a bit of the uh, political context of the country from which um, the refugee originates. In Canada, Cloudscape, which is a collective of comic artists in Vancouver, is doing comics in transit. And one of the themes of comics in transit, they have other themes, is Canadian refugees and immigrants. And this tells the story of a woman and two daughters from Russia. Um, and these comics appear in transit facilities in Vancouver, so at bus shelters, on the buses and trains. And so as we are in transit, we see those families in transit, um, again, creating that connection that they are like us. This is um, a comic from the New York Times. It won them a Pulitzer, not just, I mean, it's a long comic. This is just a single frame. Um, it's the first time they've won a Pulitzer for comics. It's not the first time comics have won a Pulitzer, most famously, of course, Spiegelman's Mouse. And it's a comic um, about a specific family of five, a Syrian refugee family, who happened, and it's, true to arrive in the United States on the election day in November 2016, and they're sent to Kentucky, and they wake up in the, in the heartland of Trump country, and so their very first day in America, they're terrified that they're going to be sent back because, of course, the rhetoric that Trump ignited, um, and I happened to be in North Carolina that day, and I can tell you it was horrific, an instant uh, change in public discourse. This work is by Jake Halpern and Michael Sloan, and it, will, it is um, due to be published in the fall. It focuses on the American end of the experience, so there's very little of the comic that's set in the Jordanian refugee camp that they come to America from. Most of it uh, is set in America, and it looks at the issues of isolation. They find themselves in this peculiar place, um, and the death threats they receive, the relocation that's caused by that, and various things. So it's moving in the direction of, of acknowledging culpability and responsibility for the refugee as citizens. So it does have a little bit of a rights focus as it emerges. Don Brown is the author and illustrator for this comic, The Unwanted Stories of the Syrian Refugees. And he spent time at a refugee camp in Greece as part of his research. And again, these, um, there's always documentation in these comics to talk about uh, how, they, how the stories were assembled. And he makes a point of saying in the afterward, I was determined to keep the attention on the refugees reporting, for example, that a child drowned in the Mediterranean fleeing horrific violence, and not that the child was Shia, Sunni, Kurd, Christian, or Yazidi. So I think it's very interesting that he 
wants to create this partisan free or, or sort of politically ideologically free uh, narrative, but at the same time he has trouble, as we'll see in a second, um, not uh, taking sides with his, his language and imagery. He does show the anti-refugee protests in Europe, and he has uh, two panels on the United States' response to the crisis, but he has five panels on Hungary's response, which is kind of interesting given that he's American. But his own metaphors and analogies are troubling. So for example, here we see the trickle of people into Jordan becomes a flood, is the only text on this page. So he's getting into that water metaphor that's used so much by the right-wing populace, this notion that the North, the global North, is somehow going to be drowned in tides of refugees. And he draws them as a sort of flood, right? Technical difficulties. <laughs> so here's the um, protests in the streets of Europe. And here, again, he gets in a bit of trouble because he's talking about the number of Syrian refugees uh, now living in the Lebanon. But the analogy he uses is that it's as if the entire country of Mexico suddenly arrived in the United States. Well, nothing is more part of the American discourse of immigration under their current president than Mexican immigration, right? That's their sort of central fear point and all of the constant rallies that he holds about building his walls. I'm going to just try to avoid ever saying his name. Um, and so it's a really peculiar uh, analogy for an American author to choose, I think. And it's part of this tension in the book between sympathy and anxiety that is never resolved and which I don't think is intentional, or at least there's nothing to, to help me uh, understand that it is intentional. And when I talk about populists, I mean right-wing populists that, that are sort of constantly creating this narrative that they speak for the people and that the people are somehow unified and that the people are opposed to the elite who is the swamp or whatever the metaphor of the various uh, people, people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, he who shall not be named in the United States, um, Bolsonaro in Venezuela, um, the Italian whatever, the, the, what is it called, the fifth something? Um, anyway, there's all of these people out there um, who are sort of creating this tide of anxiety and fear and this false dichotomy between the so-called people and the so-called elite and special interest groups. One of the things that's always amused me as a feminist is that one of the special interest groups is always women, who generally speaking are 51% of the population. So hardly a special interest. But this is a country who hasn't been able to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in, what is it now, 55 years? Um, so, Olivier Kugler is a graphic journalist uh, working for Médecins Sans Frontières, and they frequently uh, take comic artists with them. It's one of the interesting things they do. A lot of the comics were published in French, as this one was originally, but it's been translated. And they use the comic artists to document their work, and of course it's without ever photographing anyone or creating uh, an actual trackable um, document, which can become a legal issue, as we'll see in a minute. So this is the cover, and the book jacket tells us, the back of the book tells us that what emerges, this is quoting, is a complicated and intense narrative of loss, sadness, fear, and hope, and an indelible impression of the refugees as individual humans with their own stories rather than a faceless mass. So he avoids any group drawings, he avoids anything that would suggest the tide or the flood, like Brown did. Right? It's always individual portraits or portraits of small family groups or uh, portraits of the Medicine Sans Frontier staff themselves. So most people are given a single page, so this also becomes a page inside the comic, um, only with more quotation and so on from the... Um, both from the child and her parents. This is actually her uncle, 
And he's very good at giving us multiple viewpoints on a page and details. So this is a woman who hiked four hours from one side of a Greek island to another after the boat and then was immediately rushed to a hospital and gave birth. So I can't even imagine <laughs> uh, the, the terror of that in those circumstances. So he fills up the page with these busy details, with quotations, with the story. He numbers them to help guide us around the page. So there's a sense of kind of uh, the moment, the instant, that he's very good at creating, that you really get the sense of him there, even though in his discussion of his process at the end, he talks about that he takes a lot of photos, and, but he, the, none of those are reproduced. Then he turns them into these pieces of art that really uh, suggest the instant. And he, you can see the sketches at the top of the page, so he's sort of working to the positions and the multiple pose of the mother and so on. And then he adds these little details. So we see the asthma inhaler, the medicine, the cell phones that are so important in, these, um, in this world where everybody's unstable and moving all the time. All these little domestic objects that we, most of us know and have and that are functional and necessary. And they're a visual reminder of the attempts of the refugees to create family space and life, whatever the circumstance. Although Kugler doesn't provide analysis or big picture context, he doesn't talk about the politics of either Syria or the different camps or the places that they're currently residing. But his attention to detail makes its own point. And his attention to body language, I think, is also really important. We see the stress in many of the faces in his work. Also, when he does the drawings of the Medicine Sans Frontier people, he, he tends to focus on the psychologists rather than the uh, medical, physical medical doctors, reminding us of the levels of trauma and stress uh, in these camps. And so his, his focus is on psychological health more than on physical health. And all of this attention sort of substitutes for an overtly political analysis. And it's important to note that most of these comics that come from um, Medicine Sans Frontier or Doctors Without Borders situations, of course, they have to work with all these nation states. They have to have permission to be where they are. They're very careful, for the most part, about anything they say politically or anything they say critically. So the artist has to um, create this this sensibility through the drawings, not through uh, any comment on the states. These humanitarian-focused comics do a good job of engaging our emotion, and they encourage us to be more welcoming, more thoughtful about what racial, cultural, and ethnic differences mean or don't mean. And maybe they encourage us to donate or to act at the community level, and all of those are very good things. But they do not engage with any contextual analysis of the cause of the migration beyond sometimes the politics of the specific nation state from which the people are fleeing. In regarding the pain of others, Susan Sontag argues, so far as we feel sympathy, we feel we are not accomplices to what caused the suffering. Our sympathy proclaims our innocence as well as our impotence. To set aside the sympathy we extend to others beset by war and murderous politics for reflection of how our privileges are located on the same map as their suffering and may, in ways we might prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering, as the wealth of some may imply the destitution of others, is a task for which the painful stirring images supply only an initial spark. So Sontag is arguing that if we just see suffering, it's hard for us to see the ways in which our lifestyles, our uh, consumption levels, our uh, expectations of peace and security might make us part of the cause of other people's lack of peace and security and their suffering. We need to come to know the situation in its entirety. How is the refugee crisis being handled at various borders? Ludger Priest calls it organized non-responsibility. What follows are some comic makers who try to take us to that next stage of actually engaging and expanding the refugee imaginary to talk about the rights within the nation state. And to quote 
um, the editors of Refugee Imaginaries. They ask us who is forced to leave, barred entry to, detained in, tolerated by, or at best welcomed into a nation on the most contested and fragile of terms. Uh, Threads from the Refugee Crisis was originally published as a webcomic by Kate Evans. She's a British graphic journalist. She's also published on climate change and other subjects. And she's um, embedded in the so-called jungle in Calais. So the jungle was an illegal refugee camp, or labeled as illegal by the French and British governments, um, where people mostly trying to get to Britain uh, had set up. And Calais is a city once very famous for its lace making. And so she draws on that metaphor to talk about threads and connection and so on. You can see she uses the image, she uses lace. Oh, laser thing, he's not working. Anyway, up at the top, the top frame, um, she uses uh, the lace to create the smoke of the bombing. This is. Um, the Russians bombing in Syria. She also draws the Americans bombing in Afghanistan. They look very similar, so I have to double <laughs> check. Um, and she uses lace between the panels. You can see that she's actually glued in real pieces of lace into the original, um, creating all these threads and connections. So that's her with the purple hair working with the refugees uh, in the jungle. In this particular page, they are home building, but she opens with the bombing to remind us that more people will be coming, right? These are active war zones. These are active uh, sources for more refugees. And the young man at the bottom wants a lock, and she talks about the, these little plastic houses they're building and how even though anybody could walk in through the wall, there's this symbolic desire to have a lock. But for the entire camp, this NGO has three locks. So it's a kind of useless enterprise. And she's well aware of the extent to which there are useless enterprises going on, even though she's committed to the work at the same time. And lace is the most useless of all textiles, and I say that as a sewer. <laughs> I like lace, but it is associated with luxury and decoration. It's thread used to make something fragile, transparent, and without utilitarian application. It stands in complete contrast to the desperate need for utilitarian and functional things in the camp. Even the visitors have to be functional, have to be useful. So here is the Americans bombing in Afghanistan. So you can see the sort of similarity um, between the two uh, enterprises and her reminder constantly that this is more people coming. So she leaves the frame of the jungle um, to remind us of the global mayhem feeding the crisis. She uses the right-wing populist politicians as a kind of leitmotif in the text, particularly Marine Le Pen, since she's in France, um, and has various uh, drawings of them spouting uh, actual quotations from, from hideous speeches. And she's also very interested in the media language uh, critiquing the refugees or calling them invaders and intruders. And she juxtaposes that language against these actual invading armies from the United States and Russia. She also includes a lot of pages of the attacking emails she gets. So she's, while she's working, she's publishing these as web comics originally. This is from the printed book that, that um, she completed later. And so she gets these regular sort of hate posts, and she includes many of them um, in the text for, for juxtaposition of ideology. And occasionally, she drops in straight out little sort of mini essays um, explaining what's going on in economic terms. So here she takes that flood metaphor, that water uh, imagery. She turns it into a fountain. And she talks about why is it a flood, right? And she says, you know, it's a flood because of these active wars, because of what's being done. Uh, she talks about the price that's put on it, the sort of economic analysis. She says the fine to bring an illegal immigrant into Britain is 2,000 pounds, so we've put a specific price tag. 
So she really looks at the way her government, the French government, and others are um, feeding these metaphors and feeding the crisis. She also gives good analysis of, so she uses, embeds into the story sort of various political arguments. So here one of the NGO workers is talking to a new group of volunteers who've arrived at the top. And she's sorting them out by their work skills, so who can build, things like that. Who speaks a language that's useful in the camp? So do we have any uh, Pashta or, or Farsi or Kurdish speakers? Um, but she warns them. She says, do not take photos. Photos can be used as proof that someone was here. And if you prove they were here, they may not be able to move. So she really makes it clear that there's serious consequences for people making mistakes in the camp. And she also talks about never asking a refugee their story. Don't re-traumatize people by treating their story as something of interest for you, right? Something you're collecting while you're there. So she gives a very forceful, so Evans uses these kinds of moments, and she does talk about uh, one of the things they did that went very badly. They had some new clothes, they over-advertised that they had these new clothes, and they ended up creating a bit of a riot in which a young uh, boy was, was hurt in the crush um, because they hadn't realized how, um, how people would react and they, they, did, they did it badly. So she's quite honest about things that work and don't work. She sometimes uses photographs. We can see the hand holding the phone and the phone, that's an actual photograph and it's just showing that there's no garbage collection, there's no sanitation. She's very worried about some of the children and the condition of the children and the lack of medical care. So she inserts photos, but not of people, other than one uh, later where the person explicitly gives consent um, because they've already left. But her desire to tell the truth also gets her in trouble. So there's a scene in a car where one of the NGO workers says that that she, the NGO worker, has witnessed something very terrible the day before with the French police um, and a particular woman with young children that they were worried about. And she tells Evans about this police brutality. And then Evans proceeds to draw it in close-up for the next five pages, having just promised that she won't draw it. Um, but it's such a shocking scene. I'm not going to include any images from it. But it, it shows that sort of compulsion on the one hand to show how bad things are, even when you've given a promise that you won't. Of course, she doesn't identify the woman, and it's drawings, not photographs, so it can't be used as evidence to harm the woman. One of the other artists that's working there is Susan Partridge, and this is a piece she does. So at the end of the jungle, and you may remember this from the news, the French police came in with bulldozers and just uh, bulldozed everything except this little couple of little public buildings that were shared, uh, one of which was where they did art with the refugees. And so her friend Susan takes all the paper and art materials, and she has all these young refugees. It's very much a population of young men fleeing, being drafted into all these various wars. Uh, it's about 85% young men. And she has them lie down on all the paper and draw around themselves, and then she just hangs them out on these lines of tape as a, an art piece that she called Hung Out to Dry. The NGOs working in the jungle estimate that 129 children went missing that day. In other words, they were there in the morning, then the police came and bulldozed, and they were gone, assuming that they mostly ran away, but nobody knows what happened to them. And of course, they were minors and very vulnerable to exploitation, but there was no concern to do that. So the clothesline project, which she uh, includes for a couple pages, really evokes a kind of central refugee imaginary, a central metaphor for this book that is the opposite of the floods and tides, right? Evans makes a clear argument for open borders and for a rethink of what it means to be a refugee and a rethink of how they should be treated by nation states. Evans' view lines up with that held by Dinah Nayeri in The Ungrateful Refugee. So Nayeri is an American who was a refugee herself from Iran when she was 10 years old. 
And she argues that, quote, in conversations about the refugee crisis, educated people continue to make the barbaric argument that open doors will benefit the host nation. The time for this outdated colonialist argument has run out. Migrants don't derive their value from their benefit to the Western born. And civilized people don't ask for resumes from the edge of the grave. Like Nayeri, Evans focuses on the universal rights of human beings and exposes how uncivilized the civilized can be, explicitly linking historic and contemporary fascist ideologies. And I have to admit that I was kind of shocked when I first read um, Nayeri. Uh, this is a new book. It was published in 19, or 2019. Um, that remark, she says that it's colonialist and barbaric to talk about the economic value of bringing refugees into your country, because it was one of the arguments I made uh, when I was arguing with friends. And so I was like, ah! <laughs> How dare you call me an outdated colonialist? Um, but then I realized that she's right, because then we're saying that we only value people who are, uh, you know, 22 and entering some profession or, or whatever. And one of the things Evans does in her book is she draws old refugees. And she actually, she sits with a friend in the NGO and they talk about this one very old man, the oldest man in the jungle, who's in his 80s, and why he left, why he left Syria, and what he's hoping to find for his last, last phase of his life. And it's very, and they're both questioning their own belief that he should have just stayed and died there. And they realize how absurd it is to say that. All his family's been killed. What does he have to do except try to leave, right? And so it just really, um, it, it invites us to have a different mindset, to think differently. Maybe with arguing with a particular politician, we might use that argument, but we need to use it with an awareness that it has extreme limitations. The American artist Ali Fitzgerald in Drawn to Berlin is, um, like Evans, she's embedded in a refugee camp uh, or series of shelters, really, more accurately, doing artwork with refugees. Uh, she's an American living in Berlin. And she draws very explicit links to the historic and contemporary fascism um, by comparing the rhetoric of the uh, AFD, which is the alternative for Deutschland, uh, the then leader, Franco Petri, so Petri left uh, and joined and started a new party um, called the Blue Party or something. And she intersperses historic narratives um, around the Jews that had come to Berlin at the beginning of the last century fleeing pogroms in the East, so fleeing um, pogroms in Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia and so on, and had poured into Berlin in sort of the early uh, 1900s. And Joseph Roth, a journalist, had written a book called The Wandering Jew about that. So she embeds Roth and some of his uh, refugee characters into her contemporary refugee uh, narratives and so reminds us that, we've, that the world has been here before and that there are sort of serious issues. And then she, she even launches into an interesting discussion of um, Hitler's favorite uh, type fonts and how some of them are reappearing. So anybody in graphic design will find this. Um, he, he particularly liked uh, Fracture, which was a sort of pseudo-Gothic font for the first half of the war, but then he suddenly changed his mind to Antiqua. And um, so she discusses what these fonts mean, what signage means. Again, we're in the imaginary, we're in those symbols, and how they speak to particular political ideologies. She also evokes Waiting for Godot. You'll, many of you will recognize that's the classic set design for Waiting for Godot uh, in the bottom. To shorthand the existential crisis of these young refugees caught in these shelters where they're not allowed to work, and the fact that they're not allowed to work is part of what makes the right-wing populace angry at them because they're drawing on the state. And at the same time, they're not allowed to launch their lives. If they do have professions, their skills are stagnating. They're not able to keep current. Um, and all of that. So it's this kind of stasis that's, that's evoked. In 2015, which is the time of, that she's there and writing, there are 200 attacks on refugee shelters in Germany, including torching them. And she points out the signage that's been put on the fence on, uh, at this um, refugee hostel that's on fire, which evokes Kristallnacht, 
So the um, violence of the Nazis in 1938, burning out the Jewish um, members of, of the city and, and also the Jewish immigrants that we'd seen in her discussion of Roth. Um, and so this person who's put these signs up is really evoking that fascist past and saying, you know, here we go, uh, uh, here we go again, basically. So the overarching theme of her text is, can we get beyond fear, fear of difference, fear of the other? I always think this slides upside down, but it's not. This is a memoir, so here we have a refugee writing their own and drawing their own story. Mana Nayastana is evoking the metamorphosis, and you can see the cockroach on the O there, of Kafka. And he has a very Kafka-esque story. So he'd been a political cartoonist, then it got too dangerous to be a political cartoonist in Iran. So he became a children's cartoonist. He was writing basically uh, newspaper cartoons for children that had a little bit of science in them, so a little bit of learning about nature or something. And he did this particular one with his little, he had a little boy character that looked a little bit like Dennis the Menace. And um, this one was about bugs and it was about cockroaches. And he got in trouble because the government reprinted the comic, unknown to him, substituting, uh, having the character say that the Kurds were cockroaches. And then they distributed it in Kurdish territory, causing riots and all kinds of things. Then they imprisoned him um, for what he had done. And so it's really a narrative about the intersection of a repressive state with law, with art, with journalism. And he shows how an authoritarian regime, or frankly any regime, can use unrest to, um, to increase their control. So we think about what happened after 9-11, where the American government, the Canadian government, and so on, um, reduced people's rights and freedoms in order to make them safer, right? The, ref the editors of Refugee Imaginaries tell us, quote, Western states need migrants and refugees they seek to exclude as a source of labor and legitimation, both to highlight the rights enjoyed by the citizen and to reinforce the limitations placed upon those rights. So Neistani focuses on that medium-specific element of comics, the frame. And the frame is the basic grammar of a comic, the sort of endless blocks of imagery that proliferate that's different than other visual media like film. He has one photo of his wife, and he sits in the cell staring at this photo, and she pops out of the frame to embrace him, to remind him that he is loved. And he shows himself being yelled at to stay inside the frame by, by the um, interrogator who's making him write a confession. Later, when he does get into an immigration um, camp, he's told by the UNHCR, the UN High Commission person, to stay in the frame when he's writing his story. So the notion of the frame becomes very important. Later, he breaks the frame when he's told that he can have a few days out of jail. And of course, it's kind of a cliche in some ways, but in this instance, it's also literally true because his only hope is to take these few days out of jail and run because otherwise they're just gonna put him back in and it's only going to get worse. So he gets on a plane to Kuala Lumpur where he gets stuck for four years. And it's a very precarious place for him to be stuck because Malaysia has an extradition treaty with Iran. But eventually the reporters without borders help him and now he's in France. I realize I'm a bit slow so I'm gonna speed up. I apologize. <laughs> I love this comic, Thai Bui's The Best We Could Do. Um, she was a Vietnam boat person. Uh, now she's a school teacher in the United States. And she's really focused on intergenerational trauma because even though she was also a refugee, I think she was about nine, um, it's her parents and in particular her father who uh, can't adapt and is trapped in a kind of terrible anger and stasis. And she realizes that if she's going to not be trapped, she needs to understand him and uh, not take it forward to her own child who's born at the end of the comic. So in this page, for example, we have the four panels, her beautiful art. She stays in these tones of gray and peach throughout the entire book with black. And she's interviewing her father at different ages. So she's slowly growing older, he's growing older and younger and changing. 
as she tries to unravel his complex past. He was a soldier in the American War, and of course, he was a child in the French uh, Indochina, because Vietnam had almost you know, 70 years of war, almost continuously in the 20th century. Um, so he's been traumatized by all of that violence, and his own family was full of male soldiers, also traumatized. His father and grandfather, both very violent. So just a lot of um, residual uh, pain in his life. And this is my favorite spread, a two-page spread in the comic, where she shows her father um, being moved uh, during the French Indochina War, uh, losing half his family, and then herself in a parallel mirrored um, pose, looking at her father, who's drawn constantly sitting and smoking and staring out windows because he just can't sort of uh, shift his, his trauma. And then um, herself, so the two children the same age, kind of mirroring the trauma across the generations. And then she sees it in the final text in the bottom corner as the shadow of her father's pain sort of devouring um, them. And so she has to work her way out of it. And that's the story she tells. It's a long and very well written and very beautifully drawn comic. Highly recommend it. Nylon Road is by uh, Pursua Bashi, and she's contemporary with Marjan Satrapi. Satrapi's comic, Persepolis, is much better known, but I think this is a very undervalued comic. Um, they're just three years apart in age, and um, Bashi got stuck longer in Iran, uh, so she didn't get out until she was in her 30s. And she, like Satrapi, she got into uh, studying Marxist-Leninist uh, theory after the, the Iranian Revolution. And so she uses the dialogic technique of that theory to create discussion between her various selves. So here she is, still in Iran, uh, and then in Switzerland, and she's sort of arguing with herself, only in this instance they kind of come to the same conclusion about what Iran needs to move forward. Um, she's willing to sort of look at the ways in which people get stuck in various ideologies. So here she's comparing consumer capitalism at the top uh, to fun Islamic fundamentalism in the middle and um, communist uh, ideology at the bottom. And she imagines herself as a child being sort of torn between all these ideas as a sort of dress-up doll. But she thinks of each ideology as putting you in a box. They're not the same, and they're talked about differently, but they nonetheless put you in a box. <laughs> and so she argues that, for example, consumer capitalism um, empties your head and your pocket. Um, religious extremism empties your heart and your head. And political extremism empties your heart. And the work as a whole does argue that the price paid by women in Iran is not equal to the price paid in the West. So she's not uh, arguing it's the same. But Bashi is not uncritical of Western consumer capitalism. In her work, Aftermath, Bryson argues, so Susan Bryson is a philosopher writing about the traumatized self. Um, She's a philosopher who survived a murder attempt, so it's kind of, she has very interesting insights. We live with the unbearable by pressuring those who have been traumatized to forget, and by rejecting the testimonies of those who are forced by fate to remember. We impose arbitrary term, term limits on memory and recovery from trauma. But Bashi resists the idea that the past can be overcome, and she keeps all these past selves alive in the comic, and at the end, she stops in the middle of a sentence, and all her little past selves come, and they, they tell her to stop. They just hang a sign saying, the end, even though she's in the middle of a sentence, just stop, stop. And so she draws herself. There's her hand breaking the frame at the bottom, drawing herself, hanging on a board um, in her studio or in her office. Um, so all of this kind of meta uh, leveling of, of the sort of notion of the comic drawn. Um, but she obeys them, and she just stops mid-sentence. But it reminds us that dealing with this kind of trauma, and among other things in the comic, she reveals that she was whipped by the moral police uh, for going out art supply shopping with a, with a boy from her university class, um, and was lashed for that. So she's endured a, a lot and has a lot of sort of complex uh, thinking about it. But she reminds us that this isn't, can't be finished. Uh, you stop, but you don't finish working with trauma. <laughs>
Jérôme Rullier's The Strange is a beautiful little comic translated from the French, and it tells the story of one illegal immigrant who's never named in a country that's never named from a country that's never named. And he focuses on witnessing, who bears witness to the movement of the stranger. One of the speaking parts is the crow, the crow who flies around the city and sees this man as he becomes homeless, as he becomes sick, and as he's both helped by some people and betrayed by other people. And so some of the narrators are activists, but some of them are police or passers-by or exploitive employers and so on. And it's very much about rights, right? He quotes uh, Nicolas Sarkozy in the book, um, who was then the premier of France. We'll flush them out one by one. Again, notice the liquid metaphor. He also quotes Marine Le Pen. I won't repeat what he quotes her saying. Um, but our character ends up, so here's the neighbor who reports him uh, for living illegally because she's distressed that he's taking resources from the, from the country. And he's deported, and the plane becomes this shark devouring him, sending him out back into this war zone. He is, as Hannah Arendt says, not legally and politically visible. Without citizenship, no amount of effort, no amount of labor gives us that. The most extraordinary comic, and this is the last one, that I uh, encountered is this Canadian comic, Undocumented, The Architecture of Migrant Detention by Tings Chak. Chak was a student at the University of Toronto when she did this comic as part of her master's thesis in, uh, for the School of Architecture. Her comic is published by Ad Astra Comics. She uses a combination of simple and precise architectural drawings and uh, schematics to provide a factual record of Canada's undocumented strategy as it exists. So she's documenting what we actually do with refugees. So what we show is Trudeau at the airport giving people coats, but what we're actually doing is imprisoning them. And Canada has some of the worst laws because we have no uh, end time. So many countries say you can only hold an illegal immigrant or a refugee for 200 days, or some of them even 100 days. Canada has no end stop. So we have refugees in prison waiting proper hearings and so on, sometimes for years. And it's all very hidden, and we don't see it. So she is making us see it. And she doesn't draw the refugees. She draws as if we're moving through the spaces ourselves. So she tells us how bad the situation is. This was published in 2014 or 2015, so it's numbers for that time. And then the point of view is as if we are the refugee moving through these holding spaces. So we're always walking uh, into the space. And the text is an interview with an architect who designs prisons and talking about the utilitarianness of his designs and how wonderful they are and so on. So there's no hero. There's no conventional plot. Um, but she reminds us that we only have three official refugee holding sites, Toronto, Laval, and, Toronto, and Vancouver. And otherwise, we use 143 different prisons, including maximum security prisons in which the government rents space for refugees. And then the citizenship, the identification, right? She says it determines your rights, your access, your freedom. But she reminds us at the bottom of the fragility of this, right? For some, of course, more than others. So this is comic activism at its best. She's taking the risk of representing what the government seeks to not represent. And it's the comic as documentary evidence against things which try not to be documented. The architects who design these, the agencies who run them, the profit-driven companies that build them, all of this is largely undocumented. In The Ungrateful Refugee, Nayeri tells us that when we read a refugee story, we are taking on a role of our choosing. She instructs us, consume these lives as entertainment, or education, or threats to your person. It is your choice how to hear their voices. Use all that you know to spot every false stroke of the brush. Be the asylum officer, or if you prefer, read as you would a box of letters from a ruin, dispatches from another time that we dust off and readily believe, because the dead want nothing from us. Nayeri reminds us that we are choosing lenses through which we read or listen, just as I have done here. And these choices, which are reinforced or refuted by the lenses of the artists and writers, encourage or obstruct the action we might take, whether it's political activism, 
commitment of time or money, casting a vote against a right-wing populist, or actively turning down or off the stereotypes running around in our heads. The best of these authors and artists provide analysis that give these stories, whether theirs or others, contexts which allow us to see political, economic, legal, and sometimes environmental causes for these human displacements. Even the least political refute the populist narrative that the global north is the real victim of this tide of migration. While the best enable us to see how global colonial and economic systems, foreign policy, and for many of us, our own lifestyles, play a role in creating and sustaining the failure of nation states. A failure to connect our own lives with those of the millions of displaced persons globally is a failure to recognize our shared humanity and the fact that we are almost all descendants of refugees and migrants, people who have, for many different reasons, left the familiar place for the unknown one. Thank you.